ago, COVID-19 breached U.S. borders and our lives have been upended ever since. Now, a massive undertaking to inoculate millions of Americans is underway and it will take a military response to win the war against COVID-19. Tonight, retired three-star Navy Vice Admiral Dr. Raquel Bono joins the conversation. She led Washington State's health system response management for the pandemic and offers an in-depth look at vaccine distribution across rural America. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. And tonight you're going to get answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Any question that you have about the virus, you can ask. 877-731-6733. Our phone lines are open and you can get answers. And joining us tonight from Omaha to take your questions, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little bit later, as we talked about, we're going to speak with retired Navy Vice Admiral Dr. Raquel Bono. First up, though, Dr. Gold, let's get to tonight's numbers. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? Well, first, uh, let me just uh, mention for our audience tonight that uh, many of us are celebrating the legacy and the memory of uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And uh, there are many things that Dr. King wrote about and spoke about. But uh, some of the injustices and inadequacies of access to health care uh, was certainly one of them. And there's no question that this pandemic has stressed our health care system in so many different ways, particularly in underserved communities, in communities of long-term care and older age, and people with other medical problems. And so I think it's just worth taking a minute to remember all of that. But let's get to the numbers and uh, take a look at where we are uh, today. Worldwide, uh, we've exceeded 95 million confirmed cases of COVID-19. Uh, and two million deaths, two million deaths. If you look at the United States now, the numbers, of course, are smaller than that. But we are at just uh, over uh, 24 million as of this afternoon, 23.9 uh, as of this morning, uh, and uh, almost 400,000 deaths. So to put that into perspective for our audience uh, tonight, uh, the United States has approximately 4% of the population of the world. And we have just under 25% of the total cases of COVID and just under 20% uh, of the total deaths worldwide for COVID. So 400,000, you know, by the time the sun sets tomorrow night, we'll probably have closed the 400,000 mark. There are only two other events in the history of the United States uh, that have caused 400,000 American lives. The first, of course, uh, was the 1918 flu. Uh, the second was the American Civil War. And what this map shows is that widely across the United States, but very densely in Southern California, in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, large parts of Texas, uh, uh, of course, uh, in Tennessee, uh, North and South Carolina, even in various parts of New England now, we're seeing extremely large numbers of cases in both the rural and the urban communities uh, across our nation. If we look at the top five states, as we do every week uh, on this show, uh, what we'll see is that now Arizona, particularly Maricopa County, California, particularly L.A. County, but South Carolina, Rhode Island, and Oklahoma, large rural communities are having anywhere between 109 and 85 cases uh, per 100,000 population, huge numbers. I mean, look at the California number, just under 40,000 uh, confirmed cases uh, in the last seven days. And tragically, uh, our next graphic shows you the, uh, the impact that that has had on human life. Again, as you see, Arizona, Alabama, Kansas, Pennsylvania, and Mississippi have had a tremendous impact on the loss of human lives, with in many instances uh, over two per 100,000 deaths per day. Arizona's had 160 deaths in the last uh, seven days, and we've been averaging well over 3,000 deaths uh, with some days in the mid-3,000s uh, in the United States. And a lot of those deaths are in long-term care facilities. And just to give our audience a perspective on that, Christina, our next graphic shows uh, some of the statistics there. 
while the United States average is 36% of the deaths uh, or over 30,000 deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities, it varies greatly from state to state. So the top right now happens to be New Hampshire, uh, nearly four out of five every death of every death that occurred in New Hampshire occurred in a long-term care facility, followed very closely by Rhode Island, Connecticut, Minnesota, and, and Kentucky. And what we've seen is many of these deaths occur in the rural communities in these long-term care and chronic care facilities. Our graphics show these trends uh, over the nearly 11 months now of this pandemic. Our next graphic looks at the total number of cases that has occurred. And I think if there's any good news here is over the last week since our last show uh, last week when we uh, were so uh, fortunate to have Dr. Fauci with us, we have seen a slight fall off in the total number of cases. But compared to where we were during the first peak in April, May, the second peak in July, August, uh, we're only slightly down. And we're not down in deaths as our next graphic shows. Uh, we're starting to see a bit of a plateau in the number of Americans who have lost their lives. But unfortunately, that number is hovering in the three to 3,500 range, uh, which is, uh, you know, several deaths every minute. Uh, indeed, it's almost to that point uh, in the large, dense areas of Maricopa County and L.A. County and other parts of the country. And I'm sure when we talk to Dr. Bono a little bit later, we'll hear about her experiences in uh, Texas. And then finally, what this is meaning to our hospitals, I think, is also a very important graphic to look at here as well. And that although it is a slight dip in the last several days, we're still well over 125,000 uh, hospitalizations uh, in the United States and evenly distributed uh, across our nation, but particularly impacting many of our small rural communities uh, critical access hospitals, com small community hospitals as well. And so while there's been a rebalancing, and certainly in our state of Nebraska, South Dakota, Kansas, uh, North Dakota, Iowa, et cetera, we've seen a downturn uh, since the Thanksgiving holiday. In other parts of the country, we're seeing just the opposite. So very important uh, to continue to follow uh, these numbers and very important to continue uh, to enforce all of the things that we know work, which is facial protection, uh, physical distancing, hand sanitizers, no group gatherings, and really trying to pay attention as we get these vaccines rolled out. You know, Dr. Gold, I just wonder about how case numbers are slightly decreasing. That is optimistic, but is that because we're just now starting to get beyond that spike of Christmas gatherings, or is it the mass? What do you attribute that to? Well, I think it's several things. Uh, one is uh, we are getting beyond the Christmas uh, and the uh, New Year's gatherings uh, in many parts of the country. Uh, I think people, uh, you know, in, uh, in the very densely infected areas are staying at home. Uh, they are wearing their masks when they have to go out. They are using every last drop of hand sanitizer that they can get their hands on. And, uh, and those things we know really matter. Unfortunately, it's taken a huge amount of human suffering and death uh, to get people to do those sorts of things. But until we get vaccines rolled out uh, and until we get a large percentage of the American population immune, those are exactly the kinds of things that we're going to have to do uh, to maintain safety and to control these numbers. You know, it, uh, I would be, you know, the current estimates are that we're going to exceed 500,000 and possibly even 600,000 deaths in the United States before we are done. So that's another 50% more loss of life. It doesn't count all the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hospitalization, loss of work, loss of income, loss of school, inability to hug your grandchildren, you know, uh, all of those things together. Uh, it's, it's really just time to stay focused. Yeah, and the long-term impacts of everything piling up as well. We have to wonder about that. I, I wonder about this new variant and if people are a little bit more cautious right now because they're hearing about how much more contagious it is. Can you talk a little bit about the two variants that we are watching and really how concerned should we be? Yeah, so there, there are many variants. There are many mutations that have occurred. Uh, of the COVID-19 causing virus, which of course is called SARS-CoV-2. 
And, uh, you know, the way I think about it, uh, just to understand uh, these variants, it's like, it's like beads in a chain. And, uh, you know, we have a graphic that, that looks at that. And so you think about the genetic makeup of these viruses as multiple different colored beads. That's the genetic sequence, the RNA of these viruses. And, uh, you know, if you change one bead, you change the color or you change the shape of that bead, the vaccines and the antiviral drugs uh, will be effective because they'll recognize that, that chain of beads just like you or I would. But if you change a lot of the genetic sequence, the, the chain of beads is not so easily recognizable and the proteins that it codes for are slightly different. So there are two variants we're watching very carefully now. One is called the B117 variant, which was first reported in Western Europe. And the other is called the N501Y variant, N501Y, which is the variant that we're tracking from South Africa, but has now been reported uh, in, uh, in Western Europe and in other parts of the world. And these are mostly interesting to us because these are changes in the spike protein. And the spike protein, of course, that's the part of the COVID virus that binds to our cells. And so anything that makes these viruses stickier, that makes them more successful in connecting to our cells, is going to cause higher infection rates. And so as we look at the DNA, uh, rather the RNA, of these viruses, what you see is there's a very small section that codes for the spike proteins that's indicated in orange here. And so if there's a mutation in that spike protein, that means that the virus is going to be stickier more likely uh, and therefore spread more easily. It also raises the question of whether or not the vaccines are going to be equally effective. Because as we said earlier, the more we change the colors in the chain or more we change the shape of the beads, the more likely it is that we're going to have a mismatch between one of the vaccines uh, or others. And so right now, both the Pfizer and the Moderna folks have said that with the variants that are out there, they believe that they will still be effective uh, in dealing with these variants. However, the longer the pandemic exists, the more people get infected, the more time that we have for mutation to occur, the higher the chances that we're going to change more colors in the chain of beads, more shapes in the chain of beads, and run the risk that one of the, or more of these vaccines may not be as effective. It'll still be somewhat effective, but it may not have the 94, 95% efficacy that we've currently appreciate and see. Wow. And our researchers and our scientists have already been running a race against time. This is just going to just add more heat to the equation. It's so interesting, so fascinating. And I feel like we don't get to hear about this from anybody else, Dr. Gold. So we thank you. And now it's your turn. Our viewer questions. We're going to open up our phone lines. 877-731-6733. First up, Julie of Iowa has a question. Let's listen. I am calling with a question for Dr. Gold um, about the Moderna vaccine. I had a rather severe case of COVID-19 um, mid-November. It lasted for about four weeks. I had recovered about two weeks before our company brought the vaccine around to immunize everyone. Everyone that I had asked told me that even though I was only recovered two weeks from COVID, that it was okay to get the vaccine. So I took the vaccine on the 28th of December. Uh, 24 hours later, I had a side effects that felt like I had COVID again. And I have heard from everybody that the second dose is supposed to have a different or a stronger reaction than the first dose did. So my question is, is that, was that too soon to get the vaccine after recovering from COVID? And am I going to have a worse reaction with the second vaccine? So those are all very good questions, Julie, and I'm sorry that you had COVID and I'm sorry that you had a rough time of it. So a couple of comments. One, the more severe your case of COVID, it seems the higher you make levels of antibodies. So that's good news because your body has a natural response to the virus. So more severe disease that you had 
back in November, more likely to have higher titers of antibodies, more likely you are to respond to the vaccine. And you know, you are correct. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are now recommending a full vaccine course for everybody that has had COVID. However, given the fact that you had a pretty severe case of COVID back in November, and it sounds like you had a uh, significant vaccine reaction. Now, we don't call them side effects because, you know, I can't imagine sticking anybody in the arm and not getting a sore arm. <clears throat> and if the vaccines are going to work, most people are going to have some low-grade fevers or some achiness or, you know, just not feeling themselves for a day or two. But in your particular situation, my best advice is to talk to your healthcare professional because there are two things that could be done. One would be to delay the second dose and wait for your antibody levels to fall. And one could actually measure your antibody levels in your blood and get the titers of those and wait for them to fall a little bit. Or secondly, your healthcare professional may recommend that you get pretreated. And there are a number of drugs that have been used to pretreat people uh, before their second dose. So talk to your healthcare professional, find out about timing, antibody levels, and whether or not it's worthwhile pretreating you. Thank you so much for that call. And that leaves a line open for you, 877-731-6733. We're going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. We're going to open up the phone lines right after we come back. And we will introduce retired three-star Navy Vice Admiral Raquel Bono. She's a doctor. She knows what she's doing. She knows about emergency response. And we're going to talk about the role that she plays in the pandemic. And she's here to answer your questions as well. Stay with us. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical. Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Tonight we're taking a closer look at COVID-19 vaccines as they gradually roll out and what we can expect in the coming months. Joining the conversation tonight, one of the nation's leading experts in complex medical delivery systems, it's retired three-star Navy Vice Admiral, Dr. Raquel Bono. She recently served as the director of the state of Washington's COVID-19 Health System Response Management. Prior to that, she came from a distinguished military career and served as the head of casualty receiving for a fleet of hospitals during Operations Desert Storm and Desert Shield. And as a result, she was then entrusted by the U.S. Navy with even greater responsibility. She's a trailblazer and a disruptor when it comes to saving lives. And she knows how to get things done. We welcome Dr. Bono. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Now, let's get right to this. We've heard reports that many Americans won't be eligible for vaccines until this summer. Dr. Bono, do you think that's still a realistic timeline? You know, I think that uh, with the interest that everybody has displayed about getting more and more people vaccinated, I think what you'll see is that as these, um, as the vaccines get, get distributed and they become more readily available, that there'll be a big push to get this uh, distributed as broadly as possible. And I have seen, I have noticed that across many of the states, that where they can, uh, they're increasing the number of people and not necessarily um, staying just to the prioritized groups, but including others in those prioritized groups. You know, you have seen and overseen some very large and complicated missions in your time in the Navy. When you talk about a huge undertaking like this and so many moving parts involved, patience is required, wouldn't you say? <laughs> patience and making sure that you can remember where you're trying to go during the during the evolution. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we look forward to talking to tonight because one of the toughest places to get the vaccine, unfortunately, has been rural communities. So we're going to talk about that. First, though, we want to go to the phones. Beverly of Florida joins the conversation. Thank you for joining us, Beverly. Go right ahead. I'm wondering... What symptoms do you have if you have COVID, if you have no fever, no physical feelings of discomfort? How do you know you have it? Yeah. Well, Beverly, uh, what we now understand about the COVID pandemic is that as many as 40% of people who are infected uh, and are able to infect others, meaning transmit the virus, 
have little or no symptoms. Now, that's particularly true in younger people, school-age children, college kids, uh, etc. So the only way that you know that you have it is through testing. And that's why testing uh, and, of course, use of masks, social distancing, personal protective equipment, <clears throat> you know, not gathering in groups, that those are the things that we have in our toolkit to stop the spread of the virus. And those communities that have successfully used a lot of testing and those communities that have followed the other non-pharmacologic interventions have been relatively successful in halting the spread of the virus as we wait for these vaccines to get rolled out across our nation. And that's why, you know, many parts of the country, you know, think colleges, uh, places of work, hospitals, etc., do routine testing. And it's not just for people that think they're symptomatic, but for people to be routinely tested just to be sure they're not infected or if they've been exposed to somebody that's been infected, they want to be double sure uh, that they're not carrying the virus. All right. Thank you so much for that call. 877-731-6733. Let's talk, Dr. Bono, for a moment about Washington State, because Washington State was one of the first states that made headlines regarding COVID-19. One of the hardest hit states initially, but ended up with praise for meeting a terrible situation with an excellent response that you were a part of. What do you think that you did right? And in hindsight, looking back, what would you have done differently knowing what you know now? Well, I think that's a great question. And I have to tell you that it really does start with the leadership of the state. You know, Governor Inslee was personally reached out to me to ask for my assistance. And what I found when I came to Washington State was not only was there alignment across the elected and the public and the private leadership, but there was also very dedicated people within the Department of Health and in the healthcare system there and the Washington State Hospital Association and all the professional societies. And so by being able to bring all those efforts together and decide collectively that we, what we wanted to do was save as many Washingtonians as possible and not let any one hospital fail was something that I think created synergy of effort and alignment. And um, very quickly, we were able to understand what we needed to do to help bend the curve and flatten the curve. As you look back now and, and you've seen where we are, this virus and how, how many lives it's claimed, 397 deaths in the United States, knowing that that initial response that you had to make made such a big difference. How, how does that feel? How seriously do you take your line of work? Very, very seriously. And I think that one of the things that I've, I've come away with in all the work that I've done with the pandemic is recognizing that this isn't, there isn't a single solution to being able to effectively and successfully combat the pandemic. It really has to be in all of society and all of government and all of all sector, multi-sector uh, response to this because of the widespread nature of the coronavirus, as well as what Dr. Gold mentioned, how readily it transmits even without symptoms. And so um, borrowing a, a, a term from my military days, it, it really is all hands on deck. All hands on deck. And speaking of your military days, you were known as being a disruptor when it was necessary, and especially when it comes to saving lives. Do you think we need a disruptor to step in and, and maybe change the way the vaccines are rolling out right now? Or is this just the way that it is because it's such a massive undertaking? It is a massive undertaking, and I think we have to continue to be very bold and lean forward to make sure that we're optimizing the production of the vaccines and that once they're produced and manufactured, that we're also able to distribute them. And I think the other part of it that's so important about this, this chain of events is making sure that there's sufficient uptake by people to get the vaccine. Yeah, we, we like people who rattle cages in order to help save lives. So we are in your corner 100 percent. We're going to go back to the phones now. Next up is Bruce of Indiana. Thanks for joining the conversation, Bruce. Go right ahead. Uh, I'm 81. I'm going to get a, shot, a vaccination February the 1st. How safe will I be in between the two vaccinations and afterwards? Will I still have to wear a mask and be as careful as I am now? 
So the answer to your question, Bruce, is yes and yes, of course. Uh, so you will have to wear a mask. Uh, the, depending on whether it's uh, either a Pfizer or a Moderna product that you receive, uh, we know that most of the infections that occurred in the clinical trials, in the phase three clinical trials, occurred in the first 14 days uh, after the first shot, which is why the shots are either 21 or 28 days apart. If you were to only get one shot, uh, your safety factor would be about 55 to 70 percent safe. That is to say, there'd be somewhere between a one in two and one in three chance uh, that you could still get COVID. So therefore, uh, you really want to wear your mask, social distance, take care of yourself at 81, uh, and do all the things that you have been doing to get to this point. And you really want to be sure that you continue to do that <clears throat> till you get your second shot. And frankly, you don't get the peak effect till at least 14 days after your second shot. So you think about it, if it's the Moderna vaccine, if you get the shot, you wait four weeks, you get the second shot, you wait two more weeks. So it's a full six week cycle. And we're going to be pre uh, predicting for a long period of time until we get to herd immunity that you're going to want to continue to wear your mask, socially distance, and do all of those other things that have kept you so safe up till now. All right. Thank you, Bruce. Next, we're going to go to Florida. Greg joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Go right ahead. Thank you. I just love to see the comparison numbers between a normal flu year and the pandemic numbers so we, folks can get to see the real impact and maybe they'll show up for their second shots because I know here in Florida we've had trouble with people not showing up for their second shot. Yeah, there's an order of magnitude difference, Greg, but uh, maybe Dr. Bono, uh, you'd want to comment on that because uh, I've heard the same thing here in the upper Midwest uh, from people, although uh, most, I will tell you, uh, have shown up thus far uh, for their second shot. Yes, I, Greg, I, I really appreciate you um, pointing that out. And I think it's so important for people to understand how the shots have been developed and why it's so important to get the second shot and the, the level of efficacy that you get when you get the second shot. Uh, so uh, if, you can, if you can help with the communication and making sure people understand how important it is, I know that would go a long way to reassuring people and, and helping them um, participate in getting the full treatment. All right. Next up is George of Kentucky. He says, I have an underlying health condition and managed to avoid the virus so far in a very rural part of Kentucky while waiting on the vaccine. I just want to ask the doctors if it's safe for me to get a vaccine with my underlying medical condition. So, George, uh, you know, I think it depends on what your underlying medical condition is. But right now, off the top of my head, uh, I can't think of one uh, that would prevent you from getting the shot. However, uh, my best advice, as is always the case, is talk to your local health care provider. They know your medical conditions uh, better than anybody. And they'll tell you uh, when you should get the vaccine. And by the way, which vaccine? Because right now we're dealing with two mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna product. But the next two that are likely going to be available are the Johnson & Johnson, the J&J &J vaccine, and the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, those are both uh, adenovirus transfected vaccines. They work in a somewhat different way. Hopefully, they'll be as effective and as safe as the two that currently have an emergency use authorization. But they may have a slightly different profile based upon age of patients and based upon uh, medical conditions that individuals may have. So the best thing to do is, uh, you know, same thing I do when I have a question about my health. I pick up the phone and call my uh, primary care physician and, uh, and usually uh, she will uh, give me the best advice. I know she will. See, that's funny because here I thought that you, Dr. Gold, world-renowned Dr. Gold, would just open up a book or already know the answer. But you yourself will call a doctor when you have a question. No, I got to admit, I, I'm not a great patient. But I, I do know this, <laughs> that when I need help and advice for myself, uh, I know that I got to go to an expert. And I don't like to practice uh, medicine on myself. I don't think it's a good idea. 
Yeah, well, you know, it would be tough to be your doctor. So kudos to whoever that man or woman is working with the best it's of the woman. best. It's a woman. I love it. Okay, our next question comes from a woman in Virginia. Della joins the conversation tonight. Go right ahead, Della. Hi, my question is, if I take the vaccine and one or two days later I'm experiencing a fever and the achiness that comes with this virus, how likely am I to infect another family member that lives in the same household? Yeah, that's a very good question, Della. We get that often. Uh, Dr. Bono, do you want to take a shot at that one? So I think the important thing is, Della, is that you always, even after taking the first shot, you still want to be able to practice all the right uh, public health measures that we had mentioned earlier, the hand hygiene, wearing a face mask, and the social distancing. And uh, um, we know that the, the vaccine's efficacy takes a little while to, to get into place. Um, and we are still trying to figure out how much transmission uh, might occur in people that are, are vaccinated. So um, our best advice and uh, working with your, your health provider is to make sure that you're taking all the right precautions, that you continue to take the right precautions. All right, Della, thank you so much for that call. We appreciate it. Our next question is from Nellie of Missouri. Let's listen. My granddaughter is eight months pregnant and has COVID now. What are the, is the outcome for our pregnancy with COVID? Thank you. Yeah, Nellie, I'm so sorry to hear about your granddaughter. And uh, the uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology uh, has studied this. Uh, unfortunately, there are quite a few pregnant women, particularly in the third trimester of pregnancy, uh, that have had COVID. Uh, and we know that uh, they tend to have a somewhat harder time, not with their pregnancy, but frankly, with recovering from COVID uh, because of all the compression of the on the lungs and other visceral organs that have to do with a late stage pregnancy. So, uh, you know, I, I think the best advice for your granddaughter, of course, uh, is to stay very closely in touch with her physicians and those that are managing her care. Uh, we recommend a home uh, oxygen sat meter. That's a little thing that fits on your fingertip that tells you what your oxygen sat levels are. And if it tends to rise and fall too much, uh, that's, a, that's a time that you're going to want to make a phone call or possibly even go out to uh, uh, see uh, somebody in an urgent care center or even in an emergency room, uh, depending how sick you feel. Uh, you know, this is a time of the pregnancy that you're just going to have to be extra careful uh, with decision making. And of course, uh, it's also a time that everybody else would want to be with you. But because you've got COVID, uh, you're socially distancing, which makes it even harder emotionally. The good news is that most of the disease course typically runs five, seven, 10 days. So that'll give you another three or so weeks afterwards uh, till your term uh, occurs. Dr. Bono, have you anything else you might uh, offer uh, this poor young lady who's uh, both pregnant and infected? Well, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about that, um, and I hope the rest of her pregnancy is going well except for this. I would echo what Dr. Gold said, and I think it's extremely important in all cases that, uh, that we're taking care of, of the soon-to-be mom here, and, um, and of course, making sure that people around uh, your granddaughter also remain safe. Okay, you know, we have been talking about the immediate impacts of COVID, but now we're starting to get a little bit more data about some of the long-term ramifications as well. And I wanna talk a little bit about the lungs and how the lungs are impacted by COVID-19. Dr. Gold, I do believe that we have an image that you can kind of walk us through. Sure. Uh, so this is a comparison of, uh, of a chest X-ray, a normal radiograph of uh, normal lungs, uh, what a long-term smoker's lungs might look like with uh, COPD or chronic obstructive lung disease, and then what somebody who is really sick uh, from COVID-19 might look like. So you see in the normal X-ray, you see the nice dark lung fields, heart in the center, diaphragms on the bottom, 
And that's a normal x-ray of uh, <clears throat> even an older individual, uh, but with clear lungs and normal heart function and whatever. In the smoker's lungs, you start to see a little grayness in the area of the lungs, uh, a little bit of uh, central density in the larger blood vessels in the, uh, in the middle portion of the x-ray. But compare that to the COVID lung on the far side. And what you see are these blotchy white areas, which are density of fluid due to viral infection and the inflammation that occurs. And unfortunately, uh, while the lungs are extremely resilient and recover, uh, once you can damage those lungs and cause scar tissue, large portions of the lung may not recover. For instance, I have a very close friend who is now approximately six months from his hospitalization for COVID. Uh, he is in his mid-40s, and he's still on home oxygen. Uh, and, uh, and although he is slowly but surely getting better and rebuilding his energy and his capacity, uh, he had a lot of disease uh, in his lungs and probably an x-ray very similar to the one that we're looking at. And you know, Christina, we've seen a lot of other long-term, what we call long-haul effects of COVID. We've talked at previous times about loss of taste and smell that sometimes can persist for months, if not uh, some indication uh, indefinitely. We've talked about the cardiac diseases that have occurred, although it does appear that they, they do recover uh, for the overwhelming majority. But we've also talked about blood vessel diseases, strokes, loss of vision, you know, basically uh, the, the full book uh, of things uh, that can occur uh, from this type of virus infection and as a result of long-term hospitalization. So, you know, coming back to one of the earlier questions that we had about the safety of the vaccine, you know, compared to hospitalization, compared to developing a chest X-ray that looks like that, compared to the chance of dying, particularly, you know, if you're over 65 or 75, the risk of these vaccines is incredibly low and they're incredibly effective. So all the more reason to line up, roll up your sleeve and get your vaccine just as soon as you're eligible. And to wear a mask in the interim period to bridge that time frame as well. It just goes to show how important wearing a mask is because you don't want that for yourself and you don't want that for your neighbor. So those pictures are incredible. Thank you for sharing those with us. We're going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. We still have time for your phone call for your question tonight. 877-731-6733. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again tonight, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and tonight joining us, retired three-star Navy Vice Admiral Dr. Raquel Bono joins the conversation. She served as the leader of the state of Washington's COVID-19 Health System Response Management, so she knows what she's doing, and we're so grateful to have your expertise with us tonight. We are going to go back to the phones. Norma from Indiana is up next. Go right ahead, Norma. Thank you for taking my call. Uh, last November, I had symptoms that I thought was a sinus infection, and I went and had a COVID test, and it came back positive. Now, last week, I had to have some blood work, so I asked them to do an antibody test, and that came back negative. So my question is, did I have a false positive or did I not have very many antibodies and they've run out already? Well, I'll start and uh, we can share this question a little bit, but uh, people's antibody response to the infection are quite variable. Some people uh, do mount large antibody responses. It frequently has to do with the severity of the disease, and others don't. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, and as you pointed out, uh, there are false positive tests uh, for COVID. I would wonder whether you had a, uh, a PCR, polymerase chain reaction test, uh, which are the most accurate and sensitive, or whether you may have had a point of care antigen test, which may be somewhat less accurate and somewhat less sensitive. But one thing is for sure, and I would say uh, vaccines are in your future. And as soon as uh, somebody can offer it to you, uh, you know, you, I think you should take it, uh, advantage of it. 
But uh, Dr. Bono, uh, you know, what do you think the role of antibody testing is these days, particularly now as the uh, vaccines are starting to roll out? Because we've seen a lot of variability, even in the clinical trials of both the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer products. Yes. And I think that's one of the things that we're still learning um, with the trials that they're doing is, is how long do our antibodies actually stay around? Uh, you know, for the most part, people who are naturally infected, we, we feel like a good rule of thumb is that those antibodies should be around for at least three months. But, but as Dr. Gold mentioned, we're also seeing that there's a great deal of variability in how much antibody or what kind of titer uh, people will produce. And so uh, at, at this point, with, um, with the history that you shared, uh, it's, you may well have had uh, the COVID-19 infection um, and for whatever reason your antibodies um, may have just made a certain amount but uh, i'll echo what dr gold said i think the important thing is is to make sure that not only do you avail yourself of the vaccine when when it becomes available to you but you continue to practice the public health measures of of, of social distancing and and hand washing and making sure that you're using facial coverings all right. Thank you so much for all the great calls we've been getting tonight. That leaves a line open for you right now, 877-731-6733. This is a big one. This comes from Alexandra, and she writes, Many of our rural hospitals here in Texas have been struggling just to get shipments of vaccines. Is there a problem, a lack of freezer equipment? Why are the big cities getting the vaccines, but not us? I wish I knew the answer to that question, uh, Alexandra. And uh, <clears throat> all I can tell you is that it's a supply-demand problem and that the manufacturing, shipping, and deployment of these vaccines uh, is complex. And we knew that the science was going to be hard, that getting the scaled-up manufacturing was going to be a huge challenge for these large companies to do that. I think we've done a really good job in that and accelerating, you know, think about it, a fully deployed vaccine in six or seven months from the first diagnosis uh, of the disease uh, with a full FDA, you know, emergency use authorization, phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trial is unheard of. It is just absolutely lightning speed. But as we know, the hardest part of this is frequently logistics. And, you know, I'm sure as uh, Dr. Bono knows from her experience in the military that uh, it's not just about supplies, but the logistics are very much the name of the game. And maybe you'd want to just comment on that from uh, some of your military experience. Of course. Um, it's always very challenging to make sure that you're getting the, the distribution of anything, whether it's medication or vaccine. Uh, you want to get it to as many people in as broad a distribution as you can. However, there are some additional challenges with this particular vaccine, and that's both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine is the cold chain management. And so that's the other part that has to be weighed with the logistics is not only making sure that the actual vaccines are transported successfully to the right places, but that they arrive in a condition that still makes them effective. And, and we know that that's been something that, um, that they've been paying very close attention to in the distribution. And so that may have an impact on making sure that the, um, that the vaccines are given and distributed out to all areas. Speaking of all areas, we certainly have a wide spanning audience out there. And we're going to go to Alaska for our next question. Evan joins us from Alaska. Go right ahead. Well, first of all, Chancellor Gold, I'm sorry to hear about your friend. And it's rather sobering to know that this pandemic has, has touched just about every American. Having said that, my question is um, the efficacy of if one has had the virus and has recovered and is symptom-free versus the vaccine. Um, some folks at work say, well, I've had the virus, I've recovered, now I don't need a vaccine. And I'm thinking, no, you need a vaccine anyway. Um, and I was wondering if you could weigh in on that. Well, I'll share with you uh, my personal opinion, and I'll share with you uh, maybe even before that what the CDC recommendations are. So the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have decided 
uh, uh, and I think wisely, that people that have had the infection uh, confirmed by positive tests uh, should still get immunized. And in the case of the Moderna and the Pfizer product, should get both shots, uh, either three or four weeks apart. And that is because, as uh, Dr. Bono said a few minutes ago, uh, that most people mount an antibody response for somewhere uh, between 60 and 120 days. Uh, three months is a good rule of thumb. Some people longer, some people shorter. Uh, most people hopefully will have a what's called a cellular response, which will be much longer lasting. But the long and the short of it is we think that uh, boosting that response, strengthening that response with the vaccine uh, is a good idea. However, the vaccines are unlike the virus itself. The vaccines represent a small part of the shell of the virus. In this case, for the mRNA vaccines, they represent the proteins on the surface of the, what's called the spike protein. That's the little projection on the side of the virus that it uses to latch onto your cells and, and cause the infection. Uh, and so the infection itself uh, causes multiple different types of antibodies to different parts of the surface, to the so-called capsid, to the nucleus, and, and to the genetic material of the virus itself, whereas the vaccines uh, cause a strong but very, very focused uh, response. And hence, uh, we are recommending, and I certainly recommend to you, that all things being equal, and uh, one of, by that I mean you're otherwise reasonably healthy, don't have any other medical conditions, uh, uh, that, uh, that you do follow your health care provider's advice, uh, and that you do go ahead and, uh, and get the vaccine, depending on your age and any other disease, medical conditions you may have. That'll determine uh, where you are uh, in the list, where you are in the sequence of lines uh, to get uh, immunized. Now, when different types of vaccines start to come out, uh, that might make a difference in individuals that have been previously infected versus individuals that have not been infected in addition to age and, and presence of uh, other medical conditions. And by the way, thanks for the great call from Alaska. Yeah, thank you for watching Alaska. We appreciate that, Evan. I wanted to bring it back to you, Admiral Bono, for a moment, if we can, because hearing about your new position inspires optimism for some of us who are worried about an industry that we thought might be going away. But you're working as the chief health officer for Viking Cruises. What does that mean going forward? Are you going to have to get a COVID vaccine to get on a cruise? Or what do you see for that industry? Well, that's a great question. And I think actually part of what compelled me to work with Viking Cruises was number one, they are very interested and committed to making sure that their crew are safe. The other thing that, that um, was very interesting to me was that the Viking Cruise Line was willing to take a public health approach to how would we, how would they manage through this pandemic? And so our whole focus is on making the ship as safe as possible. And we know that that starts with the crew and doing everything that we can to help um, make sure that they're safe, that they minimize their exposure, and that when we, when we are able to, being able to promote their, um, their receipt of the, the vaccine. So um, as, as you can tell, as we take that approach with our crew, we'll also be extending that to our passengers. And so one of the areas that we're particularly looking at is um, making sure that we provide testing to make sure that we can identify people before they get on, on the ship, and then also offering daily testing while on board the ship so that we can identify uh, as soon as possible even asymptomatic people who may be infected. So, um, you know, we're taking a very comprehensive approach and wanting to make sure that we, we take care of our crew. You know, that that's so wonderful that they reached out, they sought you out. It just goes to show how, how seriously they take this. And boy, I'm excited because I thought that cruising was going to be a thing of the past. So thank you for what you're doing because it's my favorite way to vacation. I know Dr. Gold, you might enjoy a good cruise yourself. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. We uh, my family and I uh, love cruising uh, and have cruised on many, many different lines in different parts of the world. And uh, the ability to do it safely. And it's not just cruising, you know, as Dr. Bono says, it's air travel, trains, commuting, mm -hmm. all of those sorts of things. You know, there are several airlines that are 
starting to put policies in about uh, point of care testing. Uh, I know many airports now uh, across our nation here and around the world are offering point of care testing for anybody uh, that either wants it or for long haul flights, they're requiring it. And it's all about the same thing, uh, whether it's opening the universities, whether it's going to church, whether it's going to work, going to school, it's safety first. If we can get safe and keep people healthy, we can get our lives back to normal. Ah, oh, boy, that sounds good. I think that's something that we can all look forward to considering it's been a year now, one year since the first case, positive case was detected. And I believe that was in Washington, as a matter of fact. Yes. So yeah, you yes. know all about that. We're gonna go back to the phones. Matt from Alabama joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us, Matt, go right ahead. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Just a question on the different states. Why is it being administered differently? I know each state does their own thing, basically following the CDC guidelines. Could the military get involved, like in some states, for instance, West Virginia's high in percentage of vaccinations they've already given out. Alabama, unfortunately, is at the very bottom of the number of shots they've given out. So my question would be, can the military be involved more in a federal response, not just state, and why the guidelines are so rigid in some states? For here, 1A, you cannot get it, or excuse me, 1B, you just moved into 1B after a month of having the vaccine here. And that would be my question about the military. Yeah, Matt, you know... Uh you know, why don't, why don't you take it, uh, Admiral? I, I, I think that would be the best, and then I can uh, share anything, uh, any other insight. But sure. please go ahead. So uh, that's a great question, Matt. And I know that the Department of Defense has taken a, a great deal of pride of being part of the logistics and the distribution. And um, as we're seeing the uh, uptake of shots increase, and we want that to continue going up, upwards, uh, there, you know, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of those instances where it's all hands on deck. And it is very possible that not only would the military in terms of the, the National Guard and the active component be a little bit more involved in this beyond the distribution. And I, I think that's that's part of the um, part of something that we might be able to see going forward as we um as we make an effort, as we as we do this next effort and next wave of getting out as many shots as possible and, and administering it to as many people as we can. All right. Thank you for that call, Matt. Thank you for all the wonderful calls. Dr. Gold, I am not going to cut off your thought. Go right ahead. No, I was just going to say that that's one of the reasons the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, increase the flexibility by merging uh, uh, Group 1B and Group 1C just to give states the maximum amount of flexibility as to how they roll out the vaccine and not create rigid barriers between one classification or another. Obviously, you know, a 25-year-old with leukemia who's recovering is far more in need of a vaccine than an 80-year-old who jogs three miles a day, takes no medication, and hasn't been hospitalized for 25 years. So we need that flexibility. And as the Admiral said, it's all hands on deck. Bring up a good point, as always. Thank you both so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold and retired Dr. Raquel Bono. We had retired Vice Admiral Dr. Raquel Bono join us tonight. So we appreciate your expertise. We know you're busy, and we really thank you for being here for Rural America. Now, if we didn't get to your question tonight, you can leave us a voice recording. Our hotline is 855 776 6147 and we'll get to your question right here next monday with dr gold thanks so much for joining us on rural health matters wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening